Good morning. I'd like to call the January 26, 2012 Planning Commission meeting to order. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I'm ready to begin. I, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please call roll. Commissioner Paul McGee. Here. Commissioner Nora Dukas. Here. Commissioner Michael Wessner. Present. Commissioner Richard Rodriguez. Here. Now it's time for public comments. This is time set aside for comments by citizens on matters up not appearing on the agenda. Seeing none, we'll move to the approval of the December 15, 2011 minutes. And I understand that there's a clarification. Yes. Uh, Chair Dukas, there's one clarification uh, in your board package for the minutes of December 15th, 2011. Under the attendance, under the attendance uh, portion of that agenda minutes, uh, County Council uh, denotes both my name and my colleague names, uh, uh, Linda Ash. I would like to have the uh, Robert Kwong with a dash and then representing Planning Division staff and also amended to say Linda Ash with a dash, counsel, legal counsel for Ventura County Planning Commission, to be precise, as that was the representation on that day for that hearing. Okay, so so made. Um, could we have a, a motion to approve these minutes as changed? So moved. I'll vote aye. 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 Okay, now it is item six. This is CUP 167 and CUP 186, Vintage Production, California. Good morning. Good morning, Chair Dukas, members of the Planning Commission. I'm Jay Dobrowalski, case planner for the item before you. This is simply a notification that there is a new operator for CUPs 167 and 186. Both CUPs have a condition which require that a uh, new operator notify the Planning Commission. Therefore, the Planning Division asks you receive and file the memorandum from the Planning Director to your Commission dated January 9, 2012. That's in your packet. If you have any questions, I'm available. Before questions, uh, we have to make disclosures. So at this time, I would like to ask each planning commission to state on the record whether or not he or she has received any oral or written ex parte communication regarding this agenda item that's not already contained in the record before us on this matter. Please disclose the substance of that information only if that information is not contained in the record before us on this matter. Starting to my left, Commissioner Rodriguez. I have no declaration. No declaration. No disclosures. Uh, are there any questions of staff? The only question is, according to the dates of the attached uh, letters, the, the notification within 10 days of writing was accomplished. Staff has no questions. Anyway. Yes, that's correct. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, I don't have any speaker. I, I, do I have to open a public hearing? You might as well. I'll and open the public hearing, and I don't see any uh, cards on this. Uh, there's there's nothing else to go. I'm just going through the motions here uh, following the uh, procedure. So uh, there's, there's nothing else to say. We'll close the public hearing. <laughs> and uh, uh, our vote would be to receive and file. So do, uh, does that need a motion? I'll go ahead and make a motion to receive and file the staff report. I'll second the motion. I'll vote. Aye. 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 Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. Next, item 7, uh, CUP 3141 Ventura Regional Sanitation District. Good morning. Good morning, Chair Dukas, members of the Commission. I'm Michelle Glukert Deanna of Planning Division Staff. We are here today at the request of your Commission to provide an update on the Tolan Road landfill. This is merely an informational item before your Commission. Uh, we are not asking for any decision to be made. Uh, we do request that you receive and file this presentation for the record. 
At the November 10th, 2011 Planning Commission hearing, the Air Pollution Control District explained that the APCD Board would be having a hearing on December 12th, 2011 to consider a stipulated conditional order of abatement in response to APCD's notice of violation for a failed air emissions source test at the biosolids facility. Your Commission directed staff to return here after that APCD board meeting to discuss the outcome, and so that is the reason why we are here today. APCD is here today to discuss that hearing and also to um, provide any further information about item one that was included in your packet. Before their presentation, I just wanted to update your commission on the follow-up tour that Supervisor Long's office organized at the landfill. The tour took place on January 11, 2012, and county agencies, including Planning, Environmental Health, Air Pollution Control District, and the Office of the Agricultural Commissioner were all represented at the tour, as well as interested parties. We toured the biosolids facility, as we had done on the previous tour. Uh, the facility was not running at the time, but VRSD had wet and dry or processed material available for everyone to smell. VRSD also took folks up to the face of the landfill to uh, be able to compare the smell from the landfill and the biosolids facility. Additionally, I wanted to address items two through four in the packet that you received. Item two consists of an email thread by and between Planning Commissioner Onstott and Planning Staff regarding VRSD's Tolan Road landfill. Planning Commissioners are free to request information of planning staff about any land use matters that are before them. Uh, planning consulted with County Council about these emails and how they should be handled, and upon advice of County Council, we decided to include these emails in the planning, com com planning Commission packet for everyone to see. Item number three is a memo from the Ventura County Agricultural Commissioner, and that is included in your packet because it is referenced in item two in that email thread. And then item number four is information that was provided by VRSD. This information um, is related to the OSHA investigation of VRSD, and it was specifically requested by Commissioner Onstott in that email thread. Uh, please note that the OSHA matter is not something that triggers the Planning Commission's direct discretionary jurisdiction over the CUP. This concludes my portion of the presentation, and if your commission has any questions for me or a county council about the items I just discussed, we'd be happy to address those. Okay, again, before questions, I have to go through disclosures. Um, instead of reading it again, we'll just remember what I just said. Good. So, any disclosures? I have no disclosures. No disclosures. No disclosures? No disclosures. Okay. Uh, so, uh, moving on, are there any questions of staff? Commissioner Rodriguez. You mentioned a tour on January 12th? Correct. January 11th. Excuse me, January yes. 11th. How long was that tour? The tour was two hours. It took place in the afternoon from 2 to 4. And what time did it commence? 2 to 4, you said? 2 to 4, okay, yes. Did you have questions? Uh, yeah, I just want to county council. Um, since this is the first time I've seen like a string of emails get attached, and particularly when it relates to either the commission or perhaps the supervisors, uh, it, I haven't seen this in the past except for some very comprehensive EIRs and things like that. Is this a policy we're going to start following? Again, I don't know how much communication is privileged is what I'm trying to get at within, between staff and commissioners, et cetera. Through the chair to Commissioner Western's question, that's a good question to ask because uh, this is your staff uh, referring to the planning division staff and uh, as I think <coughs> planner uh, Deanna uh, indicated that that uh, conversation and that that back and forth of uh, information and questions is an open line of communication uh, and issues of including those types of communications in the board packages or things like that is a case-by-case -case basis given what is going on, given the information, given the type and the nature of the communication. And upon its review and upon disclosures that are already been put on the record, in, in particular by Commissioner Onstott, um, and given what the law is with regards to communication such as this, especially from a Brown Act standpoint, we felt that it was best to just put it into the record. But it is a case-by-case -case basis. There's no broad 
basic policy that any time planning commissioners speak to staff, those communications will be divulged. Those are uh, what we would call uh, pre-decisional, uh, intra-governmental decision-making communications that would not be subject to this type of public review. But again, given the nature of the of the communications, given the status of uh, or the state of, of Brown Act law, and given disclosures that have already been put on the record, in particular by Commissioner Onstott, we felt it would be best to do it this way. So the follow-up question is, then this would be review, reviewed by County Council, these types of communication, for whether or not they should be? That, that review by County Council was requested by the Planning Division staff who was okay. received of this. Right. And so uh, they are well aware of their legal obligations, and they wanted to see what legal counsel would say. And so through that guidance, and as uh, Michelle already indicated, that was through a, a joint discussion. Mm -hmm. We felt that this was best. Again, uh, for the public, I'm not trying to hide anything, but there are four specific exceptions to the Brown Act, and also anything if I were to call county council uh, for a concern uh, in under those four areas that are uh, clearly carved out in the Brown Act. So again, I don't have any concern. I just want to make sure we're following a, a procedure that the public is, is aware of. Okay, thank you. Thanks very much. Do you have any questions, staff, at this time? Okay, neither do I. Thank you. I'll open the public hearing and have a, a presentation. Actually, I'm sorry, Commissioner Dukas. Yes. I'd like to turn it over to Mike Viegas, the okay. Air Pollution Control okay. Officer, to finish up the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Chair Dukas, members of the Commission, I'm Mike Viegas, Air Pollution Control Officer. I kind of like to set the stage, kind of recap what we talked about in November. There was a notice of violation issued by the Air Pollution Control District related to an exceedance of the reactive organic compound emissions from the biosolids processing facility. And the control unit in question was working from the standpoint that it was reducing emissions significantly from an inlet concentration in the neighborhood of 2,000 parts per million down to a level of 79 parts per million. However, the best available control technology limit that was in the, established in the permit is 57 parts per million. Uh, so I just want you to know that the control unit was accomplishing the lion's share of what it needed to do. It just was not meeting the permit requirements. The other thing I really want you to be aware of is it's in our opinion that this was not a significant source of odors. There, there was, we believe it was another portion of the plant, which I'll discuss later because there's been two significant developments since we last talked about this issue. Because of this violation and the fact that it was ongoing and the fact that VRSD is a, is a large facility known as the Title V facility, we took it as a serious matter. And on December 12th, the Air Pollution Control District Hearing Board granted an order of conditional, a, conditional, a stipulated conditional abatement order against VRSD. What this order contains is milestones that they must meet in order to get back into compliance with the reactive organic compound emission limitation. They're required to comply with all requirements of the authority to construct and the temporary operating permit except the ROC emission limit. It, the order contains reporting and record keeping requirements and they're required to submit an, an application for an authority to construct by Monday of next week. And talking to staff, they will be meeting that deadline. And this is where they're going to start to modify that emission unit to meet the standard. After the Air District grants the authority to construct, they have 15 days from the issuance of that authority to construct basically to get a purchase order for that control equipment. Construction would need to begin 30 days after the issuance of the authority to construct and would need to be completed 90 days after the issuance of the authority to construct. So they're going to be on a tight time frame to get back into compliance. And of course, during the period when they actually have to disconnect the existing controls and install the new controls, obviously they would not be allowed to operate during that time period until things are back up and ready to run again. Once they're back up and running with the new control unit, they'll be required within 30 days to source test to show compliance. In no case would they be allowed with this construction and modification and source testing 
be allowed to go beyond October 31st of this year. And that's just a drop dead date in the stipulated conditional order of abatement. And that's, I think, it in a nutshell. And I'm really pleased to see that VRC has taken this extremely seriously and, and they're moving along in an expeditious manner. Uh, we're also very pleased that they're going to keep the existing controls, in essence, in place and add on additional control unit. And we believe that's, that's very positive that the biofilter will be there. It does do a good job of controlling ammonia emissions, which can be a source of odors. And it's, it's passed those tests, so we're real pleased to see it there. The new unit is known as a thermal oxidizer, and it will reduce the ROC emissions quite capably, we believe so. And it's a proven technology. If they're unable to complete all of these modifications and source tests by October 31st of this year, they would be required to cease operations, and the only operations they would be allowed to do are in preparation for a follow-up source test. So it would just be maintenance tuning for the next source test, but they would not be able to run just for the, you know, to process biosolids. So. The other significant uh, development in this situation was on December 7th and December 8th, our compliance manager, Dan Searcy, actually went to the Nelson residence after hours and was able to verify odors from the biosolids facility at the Nelson property. It's a significant development because it actually gives the district the ability to request VRSD to make some additional modifications to the facility. And we believe one of the significant sources of odors is actually where they, once the, the dried biosolids are, they're removed by a screw auger through some ducting and then they're dropped into truck trailers. And it's, it's kind of counterintuitive, but dried biosolids have a much stronger and distinct odor than the wet biosolids. The water actually acts as an odor barrier in the wet. I'm not saying they smell good, but they smell a lot less. <laughs> One of the things that VRSD, and, and once again, they're taking it very seriously, what they're doing, and we think this is going to be a major step forward in reducing odors, is they're building, designing, and preparing to uh, build hoods that would basically fit over those open truck trailers. So they would drop into an basically an enclosed area. They would also set up ducting and fans to draw a negative pressure on that area draw that air up to carbon canisters to reduce the emissions. And we believe that should be a significant step forward in reducing the odors. When we tour the, the plant, that portion of the plant is where the most significant odors are. So we think it's going to be a major step forward for the residents in that area. And that's all I have. I'll be happy to take your questions. Do you have any questions at this time? Yeah. <coughs> This material, once I guess the truck is loaded, is taken over and it's spread over the existing landfill area, correct? Yes. As a daily cover. So what is the difference from this dried material being in a truck versus when it's spread out all over the landfill in the evening? What, what would be the difference? I, be I believe when it's spread at the landfill, it's tarped. It's, it's tarped after once they spread it at the landfill. And the other thing you have to be aware of is we went, the, the tour, it was, uh, I believe, a day after the plant ran. Yes. It was. And the dried biosolids, I guess for a bit, lack of a better word, the odors drop off significantly. The odors mellow definitely over time. It, it seems the strongest odors is when, when the material's hot being dropped into the trucks. And, and we believe the issue is, is we're having these nighttime issues is, if a load is dropped during the day, it's taken up to the landfill face, spread out, and covered. If a, loader, if a load is completed during after hours, in the evening or night, it's left in the truck overnight. And we believe those warm biosolids are a significant source of the odors that the uh, residents are experiencing in the nighttime. As I was reading this, your uh, letter I thought to myself, and I don't pretend to know anything about this whole process other than what I hear in here, 
I don't know how many trucks are filled a day normally and, and why they're filled after hours or whatever, but it seems to me that uh, you, know, you could just stop filling when a last truck that's done in a day, don't fill up any more, and then you wouldn't have to do anything. So I'm sure there's more to it than that. Um, but I mean, if, if you get, you know, whatever you create from, from, from these dry solids in a day and it's put out, spread out, and tarped, if you didn't create any more at that point that was not going to be tarped that day, wouldn't you solve your problem? I, I believe you would, probably would to a large extent. However, I believe that the amount they need to process pro. See, that's what I don't know how much goes on after hours. I'm Sally Coleman. I'm the Director of Operations for Ventura Regional Sanitation District. I'm stepping in for Mark Lawler, our General Manager. He had to attend surgery for his son this morning. So um, in answer to your question, we're running about one dry truckload a day. And we're trying to operate the equipment 24-7 as much as we possibly can. Actually, we're not running that often, but that is ultimately the goal. So um, we can adjust the operating times accordingly. And as Mr. Villegas said, once the materials covered on the truck once it's dried, that should eliminate any odors because once it's taken up to the landfill, it's tarped and covered at the end of the day. So so you create this one truckload, but sometimes it goes in half hours to get it complete. Is that right? That we usually shut down the facility right around midnight right now just because the um, we don't have that many staff that are qualified and um, skilled in monitoring the equipment because we've had a lot of different adjustments and operating parameters. So we like it staffed and we're not letting it run just unmanned throughout the night. So we shut down usually between 11 and midnight. And then because it's really dark and the landfill operating phase is significantly um, away from the processing facility, we don't dump that material until the morning. So in covering the dried material during the course of the time between when the facility is shut down and between the time it's actually dumped in the morning, then we think that that should substantially reduce the odors. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Can I ask a question while you're up there? Um, I think your, your response to uh, Commissioner's question said you generated about, generated about a truckload of sludge or of the dried, dried biofluids, mm -hmm. uh, biosolids that are turned into the landfill uh, and covered that night. Um, is that uh, is that truckload the result of the, the byproduct of uh, the processing through the thermal burners? Through the dryers themselves. Dryers, mm -hmm. okay. The wet material comes in, and as we run it through the dryers and the moisture is removed, the dried material is substantially consolidated with okay. the wet material. And how many truckloads of biofluids per day come in? It varies pretty dramatically because we take it from several different sources. So um, some days we can get five loads a day of wet material. Some days we can get as many as 10 or 12 loads a day. And do you operate or receive five days a week or seven days a week? Five days a week. And so your average yearly daily in intake of truckloads would be approximately? Eight maybe on average. And what's the quantity of those trucks on average? Tonnage. Ton. 20 ton. What do you do when the biothermal, uh, the thermal burners or heaters aren't working? It's mixed into the refuse up in the working face, the landfill, and covered with wood chips and tarps at the end of the day. And we did take people up there, as Mr. Villegas stated, that was part of the tour was to take people up there to see the wet biosolids being mixed into the refuse. And I believe it was the consensus of the people that were up there, as has been our belief. The wet material does not smell nearly as strong as the dried material, so it didn't appear that the wet material mixing into the refuse was really a problem for them. It's the dried concentrated material. But in that process, the liquid biosolids bio um, will leach down into the, uh, to the normal course of, of degeneration in the landfill. Well, it's really interesting because um, I'm not sure how familiar you are with biosolids, but biosolids are the dried solid material that come off of a wastewater treatment plant, and they're mixed with a material called polymer. And the polymer and the biosolids are then pressed in either a centrifuge or a belt press at the wastewater treatment plant. And even though they're 85% liquid, there's no free material, free liquid that comes off of them. It looks kind of like a wet, earthy material. It's not... It's not fluid by any stretch of the imagination. It just looks like wet soil coming in. So, so when, the, when the thermal heaters aren't working, you, make, you still mix that in, in with the, the liquid 
before, we, before it goes onto the landfill? It's not mixed in with any liquid. It's just or with the biofluids or biosolids. It is the biosolids. The okay. biosolids come into the landfill wet. If the dryers are not operating, the wet material is taken up to the landfill working face, and it's mixed in with the refuse at a rate of about five to one. Okay. Okay. Are you going to speak later? Um, I'm here to answer any okay. questions. Okay. Okay. I'll let let Mr. Higgs finish. Are there any other questions? I, I have an additional Go ahead. question for Mr. Vegas. <clears throat> In reading this, um, it looks like uh, they're, they have till I guess, about April 1st or so to uh, complete their reconditioning of this plant in the, in the solid, the biosolid area, with the, with the hoods you were talking about and so forth. And then they have until October 31st to, uh, to come into compliance. That seems like a long time to me. Is that sort of standard, or what was what, what well, looking for all the way to well, the one day? The application is due to the district on Monday of next week, right. uh, January 30th. It's going to take us time to approve that application, and as soon as we approve it and issue it, that's when that clock starts. So it wouldn't actually be April 1st when they're operating. Okay. So you just you're putting in some wiggle room, in other words. Yeah, it, it's it's going to be uh, working with this. It's, it's going to take some time for us. There's no doubt. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, so, uh, does do you have questions of Sally Coleman? It says she's available to answer questions. Do you have more questions for Sally Coleman? Yeah, I do. Chair Dukas, are you going to open the public hearing at this point? Yes, I will open the public hearing. Do you have questions? Yeah. Um, in the report uh, we received uh, as part of the reporting requirement, I guess, for, uh, for the sanitation district, in our staff report, uh, whatever day that was, uh, November 10th, uh, there was included a, uh, a daily log of the thermal burners uh, running from approximately April 1, uh, 19, 2010 through October 20th, 2011. Indicated um, the operational condition, I guess, of those. The run times. Run times, mm -hmm. that type of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and we already received the presentation from... from um, uh, the, the manager. Um, I noticed, uh, I, I took a 365 day snap of, of your logs and I saw that approximately 235 of those 365 days, um, the thermal uh, heaters were not working at all. And, and in addition to that, there were a significant number of days where the thermal heaters were only working a limited number of hours. Um, can you give us uh, an update in the status of what's occurring in that part of the process? Sure. One of the conditions that we received from APCD as part of the permitting process for the dryer facility was um, an alternative burner device, a low NOx burner that Benton, the um, vendor for the equipment, was unfamiliar with. And so to meet the air quality control requirements here in California, they used a different type of burner. And those burners failed on us a few times, so we had some problems with those. And Again, if you haven't been out there, it's hard to imagine, but it's a fairly complex system because there's the gas conditioning portion of it and compressor skid portion of it. Then there's the dryer units themselves with the heaters and the burners. Then there's the water treatment element and the air treatment component. So it's a fairly sophisticated system, and um, as Mr. Biega stated, it's conveyed through these screw auger mechanisms. And so there's been a lot of different tune-up problems and things that have gone wrong as we've started the equipment. And, and part of the time, one dryer runs, the other one doesn't run, or they're adjusting the PLCs, which, again, it's supposed to be fully automated at some point in time. So we're trying to control the logic through the SCADA system. And we just I'm sorry, I don't know what PLC means. It's um, program logic for SCADA. It's um, 
computer controlled set points on the equipment so that we can tell it like when to come on, what temperature it's supposed to run, how long it's supposed to run, when it's supposed to convey the material. So it's just a matter of programming all the equipment. And um, so as we've operated the equipment, different things have failed at different times and different things have required adjustments. Uh, we've had a lot of different tests that have had to be done and as part of those tests, sometimes we have to kind of fine tune the different instruments to come into compliance. So we definitely have had some startup issues. Was this new technology? Absolutely. This is the only one in the nation. It's a very, very okay. unique project, and I think that's why it's gotten so many awards is because it's, it is cutting edge, but with that came the price of you know, having to work through the bugs of operating such a sophisticated piece of equipment. So the awards came as a result of the concept of the processing, mm -hmm. yeah, but, not, but not the actual performance of the technology. I would say that's correct. Um, my recollection is uh, there was a fairly extensive presentation made to the Planning Commission as part of this CUP amendment um, on how it would operate. And, and I think the CUP was, was approved or conditioned on the representations that were made. Am I correct? Right. So I guess, you know, we're trying to find out if we're going to be in compliance with the CUP. Uh, as relates to the operation of those thermal burners or whatever else is necessary to uh... our goal is to be in compliance and as Mr. Vega says we're working very aggressively and we're working with all the county staff and we're trying to work with the neighbors and do what we can to be cooperative and collaborative and open with this I mean we've invested a significant amount of time and money and brought in a lot of consultants and we take it seriously we're, we're doing the best that we can under an order uh, thank you. Do you have any questions? Yes, I have a question. Um, you said you get as many as, I don't know, 10 or 12 trucks a day? We can on certain days. It's usually only um, Mondays because since we don't receive it on the weekend, the bigger facilities, Oxnard, Thousand Oaks, and Ventura, might have a couple trucks that they want to bring in extra on Monday. The uh, <clears throat> And so if I understood correctly, uh, Within a day, you might create a truckload of this uh, biosolid material. The dried the material from the dryers. The dried the dryers. Mm -hmm. uh, how many trucks coming in with a wet material will create one truckload of the dry material? It's about two to one. So, um, well, five to one on the trucks. I was thinking of the okay, and so then uh, you sort of constantly have a, a backup of trucks possibly waiting to no. put the material in, or what is what is it, when the wet material comes in with a truck? Is that they come somewhere? in staggered. We have one contractor, Central Coast Trucking, that coordinates. They do all the pickup and delivery to the landfill, so they go to each of the wastewater treatment plants and pick up the material. So they stagger the loads accordingly coming into the plant. So they're coming into the receiving hopper and either dumping into the receiving hopper for the biosolids facility, or they're going up to the face at a at a frequency that allows them to not be backed up at the facility. But, but all that's wet material, so that's not, as Mr. Vega said, that's not part of the odor problem. It, it's the dry material, so that's not going to create any odors over those trucks. It appears to be focused on the dried material, and as Mr. Vega says, we're in the midst of installing a hood type of device over the dry um, trailer unit, and we should have that prototype online next week. So it's not the final version, but it's the version to test it and see if that really does make a difference, which we're very hopeful that that'll relieve a lot of the odor issues. And these hoods will suck up the air? They'll be under vacuum and they'll take it to a carbon so. canister. Mm -hmm. That's the only portion of the equipment that isn't under vacuum and being treated right now. All the rest of the whole system is under negative pressure and being treated through the air treatment control device. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So also available to answer questions is Richard Baldwin of the VRSD. And um, Mark Zerbel is available to answer questions. Are there any questions of these two gentlemen? Not for me. Um, Richard Baldwin, could you come forward, please? 
what kind of questions were you anticipating? <laughs> um, I've been hired to <clears throat> deal with um, the project of adding a thermal oxidizer to the um, three-stage air pollution control device. It's going to still be three-stage, but the carbon control system will be removed. And I'm leading the permit team, and um, so if we get any, any questions related to that, I would be answering questions about the air pollution control equipment. What was, what's your uh, area of expertise again? What were you before? Well, I started life as, well, in the air world, <laughs> 40 years ago as an air pollution control engineer in Pennsylvania and spent seven years in San Diego as the uh, chief of enforcement for the air pollution control district there. And I spent 20 years in Ventura County as the air pollution control officer. So I'm, I was uh, Mike's predecessor. Okay. And the reason, Since, why I'm asking, I, the reason why I was asking you that is it was my recollection uh, at, our, at our last meeting regarding this is that um, you didn't smell anything. You didn't think that there was a smell at that time. That was your, as my, if I, your recollection is correct, that's, that's what you said to us last time. Yeah, I was asked by the RSD to see if I could detect odors from the facility off-site, so I drove around in different places. I don't live there. I went there in the morning, I went there in the afternoon, I went in the evening, or early evening, maybe five, six o'clock, um, trying to detect odors coming off-site. Um, but because I'm not there, living there, uh, I don't have the advantage of detecting them when they're wafting around. So I did not detect the odors coming off site. That doesn't mean there isn't something there, but I was not able to detect it. And, and refresh my recollection, did you ever say that the dried material um, wasn't as, did you, did you say that the wet material, the, the undried, you know, wet makes it sound like it's this sloppy mess and it's not. Um, but you did. But you did tell us then that the undried material, uh, the 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 smell didn't come from that material. That's correct. Okay. Uh, and Mike addressed that. It's because the water is encapsulating the odors, and um, you can you can detect the light ammonia smell if you get close to it. Um, sometimes I, I've I've had to get within six inches to smell some loads and. 50 feet away before, you know, I could detect it within 50 feet. Have but you ever followed one of the trucks on the freeway or on a, on a road? No, they're covered. They're required to be covered. I've, I've, I've driven by them. I've driven behind them. Yeah. I've There's, been at the wastewater treatment plant where you can they're detect, being filled. You can detect them. Okay. You know, in your car, driving along. There's... Do you, do you find that that's true or that's not an accurate statement? I've never followed the trailer, so I don't know. Um, there's two different kinds of trailers. You have trash trucks and then you have a specially designed trailer for the uh, biosolids coming from the wastewater treatment plant. So um, if you're sure that's what you were seeing, that, that, that particular trailer it is covered. A, a, I would find it a little bit surprising that you might smell something coming from it. If you did, it would be a light ammonia odor. That's what you smell when you get right up to it. Okay. If it's the same thing. Well, I'll put my faith in your expertise rather than uh, my nose behind a truck that may or may right. not be that. It's just that it's coming off of uh, Hill Canyon Wastewater Treatment Plant on Santa Rosa Road. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, it's probably, tarped. Probably the best way to experience it is to just go up to the landfill when they're dropping it and smell it. And we'd be glad to accommodate that if anyone ever wants to go. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I just want to make sure that, um, that the public who has been complaining about this vociferously is, is and again, this was my impression, is that um, there, there, there was testimony last time that um, perhaps it wasn't real and that it was the idea of the, and, and, and I'm not saying that you said this, 
but it, perhaps that it was the idea of the sludge being spread that was disturbing these neighbors and, and not any real odor problem. But, but now we're, we're clear that there is an odor problem and we're, we're um, tracking it down for this uh, leftover that's, uh, that's dried material that's left in trucks, perhaps. The dried biosolids, when they're dropped into the trailer, smell. There is no denying that, absolutely no denying. The question is, and, and as with any manufacturing kind of a facility, you always have odors on site. The real problem is, is can you detect anything off-site? And so that's what I was trying to find is, could, you, could we detect these odors off-site? So Dan Searcy um, finally did and confirmed that, in his opinion, the, you could detect the dried biosolids off-site. Um, we'd been talking previously before that, with, in, internally talking, about what should we do, what is the best way to contain the um, dried biosolids, particles, and gases so that they cannot get off-site. We had no proof they were getting off-site. Now we do. Um, but anyway, the, uh, a, a, a different engineer, not myself, has come up with a design. Actually, two different engineers working together on it have come up with a design to cover the trailer. It's a cover that's going to be raised so the trailer can come under it. The cover will drop. The material will be filled into it into the trailer in the same staging stations. And then at the end, there will be a vent taken into an air pollution control system, which um, will include a bag house followed by a carbon bed. It's actually a two-stage air pollution control device. And does any of this uh, uh, have to come back to planning for, for any reason? Does this uh, hood and this vacuum, does this come? Does this change the CUP and does it come back to planning? Um, I'm directing this to uh, the planning director. And yeah, I, you know what? I would like to take just a look at it to see what exactly our conditions say. I'm not sure that we were so specific about that very detail or whether we just said it needed to work in accordance with the conditions. So it's unlikely okay. that it would. It are probably going through the building and safety department, I imagine, or it will be going to the air pollution control district. district. Okay. Air pollution. I'm just we'll take a look at that, but really, I'm really, really interested in, in moving this along quickly, and I'm sure you are too. Thank you very much. Are there any other questions? This yes, week? I've got a question. Go ahead. Uh, my recollection, you're, con, uh, you're a consultant for BRSD, is that Correct. right? Correct. Yeah. Um, our testimony from a number of uh, neighbors last time, and the, the gist I got of it is are these odors were showing up 8 and 9 o'clock, 10, 11 o'clock at night, something like that. But ba based on what you just said a moment ago, you were never out there at those hours. Wouldn't it made a lot of sense that is that if that's when the neighbors were smelling all of this, to then go up at the plant at that time at 9, 10, 11 o'clock at night to see, gee whiz, is there smell going on at that time? Well, there's two things, the hour and the other is getting access to where um, People are smelling the odors. I don't have access to the private properties at all. Well, I imagine if you walk down that main <clears throat> but, street, you, you didn't have to go yeah, to somebody's but property. It, what's, what's happening, when, when the air mass cools, it gets dense and starts going. It runs like water, and it goes downhill. It's air, cold air runs like water. It's the best way to think of it going downstream. And that's when you're going to start detecting odors. It cool, so I was out there when it was cool, and we had down canyon drainage. That's the key. So the air mass is flowing across the biosolids drying facility, including the trailer, and going off-site is somewhere. The key is it's going off-site. And so I was downstream trying to detect the odors. And on the days that I was there when the air mass was going downstream, downhill, I could not detect the odors. That doesn't mean... In, in, you know, there's a good chance there was no odors there at that time. It seems to be kind of sporadic, even with the complaints. I wasn't out there every day. I was out there a few days trying to see if there was something obvious. Well, it just seems to me with all the hoopla that was going on about this and community relations and so forth, <clears throat> and if the neighbors are saying maybe it takes a while to get down to where the houses are, I don't know that that would have been a good time to be wandering around 
at night up there, and so maybe it didn't have to be you, but it could have been some, some employee of the RSD to go around and, and see if they could find that smell at that time, and maybe this issue would have been resolved much longer. Actually, some of the um, residents have been given the cell phone number of some of the VRSD employees to be able to go out and respond, and they have gone out, and uh, it's been some time since they've done that, but VRSD did make that effort, but I'll have to let Sally talk more about that because I really wasn't involved in it. I just know about it. Thank you. Any other? Yes. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so you wanted to follow up with Sally on that? I'm sorry, Ms. Coleman. Um, I, I, I guess I asked a question, two questions. Uh, First one is I spoke to you about uh, about the uh, thermal heaters and the operation now, and you kind of gave me a you know overall answer, but I didn't, didn't catch specifically. Are those thermal heaters working now? Yes, when, both are online and both are operating. Okay. We've had. Um, we're putting in more advanced water treatment, and so the system's been down a little intermittently in the last few, like the last week, as we've hooked up what's called a DAF unit. It's dissolved air flotation. Okay. And is the the water byproduct still being used uh, for dust control? And it is. We've done some ammonia adjustment for that, and with the DAF unit, we feel that the ammonia scent in the water is reduced. And I apologize. Three questions. Thirdly, we heard testimony from uh, from various witnesses, adjacent property owners. Um, one specifically uh, sticks in my mind: an adjacent property owner with an orchard um, that had a fly infestation problem so bad that they really literally were driven indoors, and employees are having difficulty working out there. What is the status, or what if, what that you're doing addresses that part of the problem? And I don't recall if you were here in November or not. I was not here. Um, we haven't had complaints from the Ag Commissioner's Office in regards to flies. I mean, we have the inspector from the Ag Commissioner's Office out quite often to monitor for birds and flies and dust control, and that hasn't been something that has been brought to our attention as a big issue. Well, I mean, my recollection was it was fairly significant. Um, it was at the at the last hearing. There were there were a number of people who said that there was. A, a significant number of flies that um, perhaps coincidentally came along the same time as the um, this system being up and going. I guess the one thing that I would say that has been challenging about this whole process is that as we put the system online, one of the things that made it a little bit difficult to conclusively determine that it was 100% the landfill biosolids project was there was a lot of application of compost materials from LA County and um, City of LA being brought in from out of the area and delivered to the orchards and I know that environmental health and planning different people were out looking monitoring all these different things so I don't I don't know exactly where the flies were coming from but again all I can speak to is what I'm told by the inspectors that are inspecting our site, and we were not told of a fly problem by the Ag Commissioner's Office, which is responsible for monitoring the flies. So um, I have heard that people have had fly problems, but if they're not coming onto the landfill and saying, you have a fly problem and here's an, a citation or a notice or something, it's not something that I can really control if it's down at their property. I, I'm responsible for what happens at my site and my operations. Okay, thank you. Anything else? No, I was just going to follow up, and I don't want to do too much testimony. We're supposed to be just receiving a report here. But I remember specifically the Ag Commissioner testifying as a follow-up to that, that they had gone out, and they testified specifically, given the flight patterns, the capacity of flies, the distances that they're very familiar with, that uh, where this person was complaining was literally too far for the, the fly problem to have migrated from that property to another. Uh, again, and they're the experts as far as how what flies and can and can't do. I'm not going to argue. And number two, the Ag Commissioner also testified that the entire county was experiencing at that point in time a, a significant fly increase. And uh, again, the testimony was that it happens occasionally for multiple different reasons, and it could be specific to the farmers, what they have brought in to fertilize, or just 
the seven-year cycle. So I remember the conversation, and I remember the Ag Commissioner coming back and <clears throat> identifying that issue, particularly for the fly to migrate from the landfill to the, the property that was identified. It was too far of a distance for the, uh, the fly to uh, travel. But uh, again, I just want that was the testimony I, I remember from the Ag Commissioner. Okay. Uh, Mark Zerbel, could you come forward, please? Because if I was going to do that to Richard Baldwin, I'm going to do it to you, too. Okay, Madam Chair. <laughs> what questions were you prepared to answer? Uh, I'm just here to observe. I, my principal responsibilities have to do with um, the permitting regime. And so I just have an interest in uh, the interpretation of and any discussion regarding uh, the conditional use permit uh, conditions or the air pollution control district permits and uh, um, basically I was here to observe. Uh, I've obviously been involved in all those permitting processes and if there's any question regarding you know, where we're at on any of those or how we got there, I would be glad to help you understand it, but um, uh, that's why I'm here. So this abatement order Um, what happens if you are if you're unable to operate the machinery uh, uh, so that it operates at the parts per million that uh, that it's supposed to? You still will receive um, biosolids. Is that correct? At, uh, you mean at what time frame? There's, there, the abatement order has a, a schedule built in, and it's designed to get us to a goal. And as the commissioners have observed, um, it's, it's longer than it seems like it should be, but that's because we've built in time for the regulatory review, which um, uh, takes time. And uh, if we are unable to achieve the requirements for the part per millions of ROC as specified in that abatement order by the drop dead date, uh, the, uh, the facility will have to cease operation and, and it will not operate. Do you have a, a, a plan B? Plan B, I'm sure at that point would be to, we'd be shut down at that point, would be to go back to all the design engineers, all the air pollution technology and information that we can find, identify another way of uh, taking care of the emissions, go back with uh, you know, a, a, a new proposal to APCD, submit a new application to construct, which is what we're submitting tomorrow on a thermal oxidizer. And uh, if we're able to get through that regulatory process, then uh, proceed to a request for an opera, uh, permit to operate under that new scenario. Okay, and, and the other thing that I want to have clear is uh, this would, this, if that should come to pass, mm -hmm. this would in no way inhibit uh, the number of trucks that are still going to make deliveries of, of sludge from the wastewater treatment plants. Is that correct? The, the default position right now on, on the handling of that waste is to um, put it in the landfill. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Are there any other questions to the speaker? Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ross Garcia. Rosa. 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 I apologize. Please state your name and city of residence. I'm Rosa Garcia, and I live in Santa Paula, California, and I live on the Nelson property. I'm just here to let you know that I did smell the odors last night. That's practically what I'm here for. And um, I, when all this started, I was concerned with my daughter's health, and but they keep saying it's okay. I don't know if this is true, but I mean... Um, Whatever the biosolids smell, you smell. I mean, if that's that's okay to smell it, then I mean, I used to live in in, a, in an area in New Mexico where they used to burn poop, so I know the smell of that. And to me, that was awful. And I didn't want it to come to this country and smell the same thing. So 
I wish and I hope that they do come up to a solution soon because I'm tired of smelling the same smell. And that's practically what I'm just to give my testimony on that. Okay, thank you very much for coming down. It's good to have first-hand testimony like that. Any questions? Okay, sorry for mangling your name. Gordon Kimball? Good morning, Chairperson and Council Members. My name is Gordon Kimball, and my family and I farm in Timber Canyon, just to the west of the landfill. Um, I want to thank you for taking the time and making the effort this morning, and and I want to talk a little bit about why that's so important. Um, the the VRSD has been all through their operations very good at denying, deflecting, confusing, and delaying. And I think that the air pollution district can attest to that in order to after two years of effort trying to get the VRSD to make their equipment work they finally had to get an abatement order basically a legal requirement forcing them to do a deadline because they weren't doing it up till then um, I really appreciate the efforts that the APCD has made on this they they've gone I think above and beyond trying to understand it um, and I really hope they're right. Um, having been up there and seen this biosolids plant work twice, um, it may be that the biggest source of the odors is, is the wet stuff or the dry stuff, the hot dry stuff they dump in the trucks. But the fact of the matter is that plant stinks. You walk around it, it stinks all the way around it. You leave the rest of the day, you're going like this. What is this? I stink. It's in your clothes. That plant stinks. And it may be under vacuum like they say, but it still stinks. And it's not a nice smell. It's, it's not even a compost or a, 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 a landfill stink. We all smell the landfill. We live around it. We've lived around it for years. We know what the land this is. This is way worse. So I want to say that I believe that that what, will, what has got their attention is these hearings in this room before the APCD hearing board and before your board. And that's what's in, made them believe they have to do something about it. So, and the other thing I'd like to clear up just briefly, if the dried biosolids are used as alternative daily cover, they're not tarped. If they're tarped, they're the trash underneath. Alternative daily cover is a cover that's used on top of the trash in place of dirt or in place of a tarp. So you, you can have it both ways. They can't call it alternative daily cover so they don't have to count it as part of their daily tonnage of trash. If, if they use it without the tarp, it's there mixed in the dirt on the ground overnight. Um, so again, I'd like to thank you for taking your time. I know that you put a lot of effort as the Planning Commission into the hearings for this permit modification. And I'm probably the last thing you want to do is have that permit come back again. So I really appreciate the time and effort you're taking. And I want you to know that it is making a real difference. So thank you. Thank you. Any questions from the speaker? OK. Uh, Jason Raleigh, really? Really. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, I'm Jason Rayley. I live at 273 Poland Road, which is just about a half mile up from Highway 126 on the west side of Toland Road. Um, one thing before I start the comments, that I think I, I may not have been here for the part of the hearing that Commissioner uh, Wesner was referring to uh, where the Ag Commissioner uh, talked about the flies. My recollection is that it wasn't the Ag Commissioner. It was the VRSD, uh, Mark Lawler, reporting that they had talked to an entomologist and that the distance that the flies had to travel was only a quarter mile, which was too far. Um, I, since we're not 
only talking about flies today. That could be a whole other hearing. I hope it's never that way. Um, I've, uh, I'm a professor up at UCSB, and I consulted with folks at UCSB. Um, it's, I have a completely different set of possibilities for the flies that could put the landfill squarely in it, in the middle of that problem, not as a sole source, but as a kind of catalyst source. So I'd, I'm happy to talk about that. And, certain, and flies, for what it's worth, can travel up to three to four miles. Um, it's not unusual. I can also, uh, again, provide documentation about the way that our federal government responds to flies on a military basis. It's a real problem, and they, they know a lot about how these flies work. And not to interrupt you, Mr. Thank you. I mean, again, we get experts up here, and yeah. I'm not an expert on flies. Yeah. So, again, if we get I wish I weren't. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, again, I thank you for the information. Yeah. Um, so, for my comments apropos of today's, um, today's agenda, um, so what have, just, I think quickly, what have the problems been? The one we're talking about in particular today is odor, although we're also hearing about the other emissions that are regulated. Um, the odor, which is beyond what kind of a problem is it? It's not just an annoyance. Um, uh, Rosa Garcia just testified. It's, it causes nausea. It causes headaches. It makes people ill. I don't get that at my house, but it just, that's, it's clear that the problem is not merely uh, I don't like that smell problem. Um, who's suffering that problem? It's not just the Nelsons, which is Anita and Doug Nelson. It's also Rosa, her husband, and her child. It's the Bartles, as Commissioner Onstott, who's not here today. The smell is not just at one home, and it's not just with one person at that home. It's with all the families who are nearby. As for the, another problem that's been on the table is the dust. I want to mention the dust problem uh, because I think it, it feeds into the overall concern. Uh, and I want to lump, the, no pun intended, lump the dust problem into the mud problem because the mud problem on the roads is what causes the dust. It dries up and there's dust. Who's complained about the dust? The Bartles have complained about the dust. I've not complained about the dust, but we have a lot of dust sitting on that road. Um, and every farmer in that area needs to worry about the dust because of its impact on the crops. Finally, the fly problem. Uh, beyond it being a merely an annoyance, it's also an economic issue. Um, as Ben Curtis uh, uh, testified last time, uh, his worker is unable to work, uh, but there's also a significant possibility that they're, they're identified as vectors uh, for um, other kinds of biological problems. Where are we now with respect to all this? I'm frankly optimistic about the odor uh, problem getting fixed. Uh, it still smells. It smelled last night. I didn't know that. I hadn't talked to Rosa, but it still smells. But at least we've identified a likely source, and it seems like the VRSD is moving actively to try to fix it. And everybody seems to be on the same page. Nobody's wondering where the smell comes from anymore. That felt like a significant hurdle. Where are we on the dust? Um, we are on a, we're, it's a lot like where we were a year and a half ago with the odor. Just give us a call. Um, I can tell you, I have a picture on my phone of, their, of VRSD's response to the call. Uh, there was a lot of dust. There was a lot of mud on the road. I don't know if it was a VRSD response. I take that back. Um, soon after, there was a complaint about mud on the road being tracked by the trucks coming from the landfill. There was a water truck washing that mud into the gutter, which goes straight into the Santa Clara River. Um, that seems like a significant concern, and I don't think it's legal, but that's not my, my purview. And as for the, for the flies, where are we now? It's winter, um, and when it's not winter, it's blowing Santa Ana winds. So we don't get flies during the winter for at least two reasons. Um, so we're in a good, a good place with the flies. When it gets to be the time to have July 4th barbecues at my house, I will be sure to extend an invitation. We'll see how the flies are going then. We haven't been able to have any barbecues for the last four years, uh, three years, because of the fly problem. So why worry about all this? It seems like we're making some progress, at least on the odor. Why worry about this? In the first place, I think what's been understated or not stated at all is the possibility of a public health threat. Um, the, the odor, I, I mentioned, it's causing physical I issues for the people who are suffering it. In, all that time that we, nobody's identified the source, it's obviously not been tested. So we don't know what kind of, we don't know, we know the source, we know that it's a problem, but we don't know, because nobody's tested it, what the actual, if there's any possibility of there being a health problem. Um, as for the, for the dust, um, I was trying to connect some dots. Um, that mud comes from the face of the landfill. The face of the landfill, the landfill's um, being filled with sewage sludge. Some of it dried, some of it not. Um, I'd be surprised if there weren't some tracking of sewage sludge in the mud that makes its way onto the streets, which either dries and becomes dust or gets washed down into the river. So the two distant points on that, sludge, dust, into our river. And as for the flies, again, I can refer you to the um, Armed Forces reports. 
on why it's a problem beyond merely annoyance. They have to worry a lot about disease anytime there are what they call um, filth flies. They're not just house flies. You may hear it called that. They're called filth flies. There's various species, including house flies, and they track. It's gross. They, they track stuff. <laughs> I used to tell my wife when she would shoo flies off of our food at these July 4th barbecues that we tried to have that, uh, no, they're just flies. And then I started looking, and then we started covering our food outside. It's, it's bad stuff. Um, the other reason to worry is not just that the public health threat's been understated, but the VRSD and, and Mr. Kimball, uh, I think, refer to this. The VRSD has been slow as, as a kind way to talk about the way the VRSD has responded. Um, they've, they've denied it. I'll talk, the, there's been an evolution of their response to the smell problem. We heard it doesn't smell. That became, we're pretty sure it's not us. Then it became, it's them. And then it became, it's us, but we don't really know exactly where it's coming from. Um, and that took two years. It's not just denial, it's also misdirection. In fact, one of the VRS, I think I mentioned this at the last hearing, one of the VRSD board members uh, suggested that the VRSD employ a, a technology called the nasal ranger. And they were, he was told by Mark Lawler, according to the board minutes, I wasn't at the board meeting, he was told by Mark Lawler, that's not our problem, that's the EPCD's problem, to find the smell. Um, I can share those minutes with you if you like. So there's this denial and misdirection. It's not us or until it's our problem, it's not our problem. It's somebody else's problem. So that's why, uh, that's the nature of this problem. What do we know about how these things work? We know that active, frequent, Genuine oversight works. There are heroes in this story. You're among that list of heroes, frankly. Um, APCD staff has been phenomenal in trying to help us track this out. Planning staff has been exceedingly helpful when they've been in a position to be helpful. And there's plenty of folks at the VRSD that I interact with on a daily basis, not daily basis, a regular basis, um, who seem to, when they get some freedom or direction or something, they work very hard to make this work. If you go up there to the landfill, there are people tinkering, walking around, working on this, these problems. So there are people, it seems like there are the right people in place. Um, and we also know that there, but we also know, I said frequent oversight works. We also know that that's in fact how the VRSD sees it. Just today, Sally Coleman, who I've had lots of interaction with and she's been terrific, in our, in our personal conversations. Um, but she said today, our goal is to be in compliance. Their goal is not to make everything work great. Their goal is not to make sure that the neighbors are happy. Their goal, their goal is to be in compliance. And furthermore, we're doing the best that we can to comply with the order. When there's an order and when it's a question of compliance, the VRSD does just fine. I have two daughters. Uh, they share a bedroom. One of them is six years old, one of them is three years old. The bedroom is frequently a mess. If you've had kids, I think you know how this works, right? So you walk into the bedroom and you say, uh, there's a mess, we need to clean it up. And what's the first response? It wasn't me, right? It was my sister. It was her. And it's easy because the six-year-old frequently points to the three-year-old, and the three-year-old has only recently learned how to defend herself. It's the six-year-old's problem, it turns out. Every time I walk in and there's a mess, it's always the six-year-old's clothes. It's always the six-year-old's stuff. I'd be a fool if I responded to the situation by walking in every time and saying, Who's, who made this mess? So what's the deal now? What do we do? I've got my six-year-old on a plan. I come in every morning with my six-year-old, and we say, how's the room look? And she can respond and say, I, you know, it's, I got this mess. I got to clean it up. Guess what? The room's getting a lot cleaner. It's not because I've gone in and done the same thing and said, whose mess is it? Let's identify the problem. Or let's work together. It's, it's not, doesn't matter whose mess it is. Let's get the, you know, let's clean it up, all of us. Instead, what's worked is for me to change tack and say, listen, six-year-old Lilia, we got we to gotta, we gotta figure this out, and I'm going to be on you, on you, not on you and your sister, on you, because I know you're the problem, until you make a new habit, a new habit of cleaning up your own mess. I'd love it if we could figure out a way to really help the VRSD make a new habit of cleaning up what we're pretty clear is their mess. We can't do it, and so we need your help. Thanks. Thank you. Were there any questions of the speaker? No. Okay. Uh, we've had uh, three speaker cards that um, 
have uh, raised concerns about uh, pathogen-laden dust. And so uh, I'm not sure who to direct this question to, someone, someone from the, um, yeah. Uh, what, what do you say about um, the concerns about perhaps the, the dust is uh, biosolids dust and uh, what kind of pathogens are in that dust? I don't really know what pathogens are in the dust. I know that we take active dust measure, dust control measures, and that's what Jason's referring to with the water truck that we try and wash things down. We implement a lot of BMPs at the landfill. We don't typically wash out on Tolan Road, except when we have gotten a complaint from the neighbors. We have a street sweeper that comes up and down the road, and like I said, we have um, dust control measures at the landfill. We have a water truck at the landfill. We try and control it, and the landfill is actually 343 acres large. It's a big facility, and the um, active working face is kind of in the center of it. So we try and do everything we can to get whatever dust is on the trucks um, after a rain event. It's typically worse after a rain event. It's not a big problem from what I understand um, during the most dry days. But after a rain, there is a lot of mud that's tracked out. And as they go down the road, we try and keep the road wet so that it'll come off of the truck tires in the landfill and not on the road. But we have gotten complaints. We are looking at, um, I don't know if we'll be able to, but we're trying to look at different street sweeper type options to purchase something this next fiscal year if possible, because it seems like what we're doing right now is maybe not effective. I don't know if there's maybe some truck washing equipment or something that we can do for the wheels or, like I said, street sweeping. We're just investigating different options to try and escalate that a little bit better and control that more. Do you have, like, um, track out devices? Do we do. We have um, shake racks installed. Mm -hmm. Like I said, we have a lot of BMPs in the landfill, but we can't really control what happens outside of the gate other than, like I said, we've gone out there with the street sweeper and we've gone out there with the water truck. But um, the BMPs are actually installed at numerous locations in the landfill itself and on the roads in the landfill. And the, and the water truck is uh, permissible under your CUP? The water truck on the outside streets, it, it you know, washing the, this dust into the, into the ditch, that's uh, part of your COP, COP? You know, I don't... I don't no, that it is. I'm not really sure about that. And I think we've only done that a couple of times in response to the complaints we've gotten. So it's yeah. not something that we do on a regular basis. I understand. Any other questions? Um, what would you say about people who are concerned about their children's health? That, that, that it does make one nauseous and, and feel ill. We have had two... Um, studies done by an industrial hygienist, an outside third-party objective industrial hygienist who came in, and they did a pneumonia study and a sulfur study, and they evaluated the concentrations of those constituents in the waste stream, and they found that they are substantially below what's called the permissible exposure limit, and um, we did is that. that for, is that for adults or is that for children? I don't know off the top of my head. I believe it's, I, I don't know. I really don't know if there's a difference between the two. I d I'm not an industrial hygienist myself, so I can't really speak to that. Um, they did the study, and they found, because we had some irritation from our employees, they complained, and they said that they, you know, had a little bit of burning sensation in their eyes and throat. So we wanted to make sure there was no health risk associated with that, and it's substantially below any health risk for those constituents. So you would tell, for example, the, the person who testified earlier, uh, her concern about about her kids smelling this smell of burnt poop that uh, that it's not a health impact. I would say that the studies we've conducted indicate that it's not a health risk. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, are there any other questions of staff? Yeah, questions, staff. Um, it seems like uh, the uh, BRSD has a drop debt date of about, as I recall, October 31st of this year to get it to work, get the, the biosolid management uh, uh, equipment to work or shut down, as, as I understand it. Um, my question uh, is, what is... Uh, what impact does that have on the CUP? 
in that part of the uh, the major part of the process of, uh, of the amendment uh, was that uh, the biosolids were in fact going to be processed and in essence um, no harm would happen uh, as a result of that to the area in a general sense. Um, so what happens now when when and I'm not asking for a I'm not asking for an answer now. I'm just asking the question. So what happens to the CUP and the continued importation of biofluids into that location? So specifically, then you want to know from the planning department if they don't get this facility up and running, what impact will that have on the current conditions that we had as far as the biosolids Correct. facility? Okay. All right. I have the conditions in front of me. I'll take a look at them real quick. Okay. And you said you didn't need that answered now, but you want that. No, to I just, be. I just, you know, we've got. It, it's a shame that that uh, that uh, the timeline has to be pushed out so far. I can under, I can appreciate this need to have staff time to process reports and stuff and to gather in the information, but the reality is the technology is still being developed as I as I hear it, and uh, the first step of that is to um, install a prototype. Uh, that by its de definition is not the end product of what's going to be there uh, to cover those trailers. Um, and I just see continuances coming beyond that October date because something's still not working right. And in the meantime, uh, those that have given testimony here as to the impact of the uh, uh, of that process going out at, uh, because of the biofluids um, the impact it's having on on them personally and, and you know commercially and economically um, is in advance. So that's why I'd like to know what impact that's going to have on the okay. CUP. Okay, we'll okay. review them. But I also want to note in the letter that you have from um, the Air Pollution Control Officer Mike Vegas, it says that you know the only operation of the facility after the October 31st date would be limited to maintenance, tuning, and test running of an immediate preparation for additional source testing. So it's not like, you know, the 31st is the end date. There's additional opportunities for them to, you know, get this up and running. Is that correct? No, I think, yeah, and I understood that. Uh, I understood that, that portion. Okay. Um, any other questions of staff? I'll close the public hearing. And uh, we'll have a motion to receive and file this. I'll make a motion to receive and file. Second. I'll vote. Uh, Aye. 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 Thank you very much for coming out and, uh, and sharing your expertise with us and sharing your experiences with us. We'll get it done. Thank you. Do you want to take a five-minute break while uh, the room clears? Yeah, do you want to take a five minute break? Five minutes. Our, our meeting, so thank you again. So, this is uh, item eight discussion report by the planning director on board actions and other matters. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I have a few things to talk to you about. Um, specifically, there was a hearing on the agenda for next week, February 2nd. That item has been moved off of the calendar um, and tentatively set on the February 23rd agenda where you already have uh, an item on there. That is a new CUP to reauthorize a greenhouse nursery. So there won't be a hearing next week on the 2nd. Um, we're trying to move that, as I said, on a date that you already have an item there. The item on the 23rd is going to be the item that you asked for a report back on um, on the order to comply with the Surface Mining and Reclamation Act for the Ojai Quarry. Um, as far, uh, and then you have, let's see, one more item that's been scheduled is March 1st, and that's an appeal um, of a planning division's imposition of a financial assurance for another mining facility here in Ventura County. So that has been scheduled for March 1st. And then I think we've checked your availability for March 15th, is it? 16th? 
for the planning commissioner training. So I think that we have everybody's availability for that. We plan on setting it um, for that date. And it's also not just for the planning commissioners, but we are going to ask as many of the MAC members to attend as well. So we have all of their addresses that we've received from the board offices and um, going to try to encourage their attendance. Um, we've, we've talked to you several times about things that you would like to um, be trained on and then things that uh, are important that I think that um, all members are. And so Robert is going to, Robert Kwong, our county council here, is going to do a training on, on CEQA, you know, a nice overview of CEQA, a nice overview of the Brown Act. Um, we're going to uh, talk about the MACs and their roles and responsibilities. Um, we're going to give you a, a small presentation on our Cultural Heritage Board and what we do in our Cultural Heritage Ordinance and what that's all about. Um, our work in condition compliance. There's been a lot of work happening in condition compliance, and I'd like to share that with you and how we go about that. Um, our permitting process, I think that you are more familiar with it than the MACs are, but I think it's important that we share, you know, when a, when a permit comes in, all the upfront work that is done because lots of times, like you, they only see the end results, and I think that's important that they understand that. Um, a little bit about mining, um, a little bit about our harbor department. I think Commissioner Rodriguez asked for that, and I'm going to ask Lynn Krieger or someone from her staff to come down and just do an overview of uh, it's a little interesting at the beach who has any sort of entitlement authority down there, and so um, hopefully Lynn can come and talk about that. Um, and that is what I had on our list. So if there's anything now that anybody would like to add to that, be happy to see if that can get that to happen. I don't, I don't want to add anything, but I read in the paper that, uh, that the state did something with regard to Ojai Quarry. Um, is that impacting his uh, progress with the uh, planning at all? No, it's no. No, good. we're not having any impact on the progress that we're having. Very good. Is there anything else that the Planning Commission wishes to discuss? So our training day is March 16th. Is that right, Danielle? Is it the, I don't have a calendar in front of me. Oh, 15th, excuse me. Yeah, for some reason I thought it was the 15th, yeah. Okay. You were the edge of March. That's right. <laughs> and then the last thing I had, um, just as far as board activities, your commission heard an item for a zone change at County Line in Malibu not too long ago to change the zoning from CRE five-acre minimum to two-acre minimum, and that passed on Tuesday unanimously by the board. So just a quick update on that. And then there isn't any other items on the board's agenda from you right now. So that's all I have. Sure. I thought about that, you know, make some kind of decision here. You still, have to, you still have to be on mic. We make some kind of decision here, then it goes to the Board of Supervisors, and I thought, is there a vehicle we can hear what they ruled on? Based on what our decision was, is that is that is there a process for that? There's a report back from me to you usually about okay. okay what if you've heard it the the board took the following action and then I report back to you. The only other item I think that is uh, pending right now is the Tom Barber um, lighting range and that's scheduled to be heard by the board on 228. And so I'll report back to you what the board has decided on that as well. Although sometimes so like you, you'll like read you that. Just in the paper. Did, that's how the process works yes. normally. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Is that it? No. Okay. Uh, so uh, that's it. I'll call this meeting adjourned.